There are few things more scary than not being able to breathe as you should. Why are you short of breath? Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Starting this season, we are offering a Facebook Live option for our viewers to still be able to watch the show during the regular broadcast times on Thursday nights and ask questions. All you need is either your laptop, tablet, or a mobile device, such as your smartphone, to view the show. Here's how to do that. First, log into your Facebook account. If you don't have a Facebook account, go to Facebook.com and complete the information to create an account. In the search bar, type in Prairie Doc. Make sure to click like on our Facebook page so you can get updates and notified when we are going live. Each Thursday on the Prairie Docs page, you will be able to see a live broadcast of the newest episode. You can also ask Dr. Holm questions via Facebook Live. All you have to do is ask your question in the comment bar and await a response. If you miss a show live on Facebook, it will be available later both on the Prairie Doc Facebook site or at prairiedoc.org. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Dr. Holm is off this evening. I'm Dr. Kelly Evans of the Avera Medical Group Brookings. Breathing is usually second nature, unless something happens to interfere with the normal flow of air in and out of our lungs. It could be a short-term but potentially dangerous flu, or it may be a long-term chronic situation such as COPD. Whatever the cause, we just want to breathe normally again. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. People with obstructive lung disease like asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis have trouble getting air in or getting air out. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your medical questions about breathing as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is pulmonologist Dr. Michael Pietela of the Yankton Medical Clinic. Welcome, Michael. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a pulmonologist? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so I'm originally from a little town called Lake Norton, South Dakota, not far down the road. Went to Hamlin High School and then to South Dakota State University. Go Jackrabbits? Uh, that's right. Go Jackrabbits. Still a Jackrabbit. <laughs> um, always will be. Studied chemistry and microbiology here, um, mm -hmm. biochemistry as well, and then um, went on to medical school at the University of South Dakota. Um, went from there to the Mayo Clinic and did a internship and residency in internal medicine and then a fellowship in pulmonary critical care medicine. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in med school, I, I spent time at the Yankton campus. Um, when I decided I wanted to be a pulmonologist, there was a need in Yankton. Contacted Dr. Lori Hansen um, and her colleagues there and I came back to Yankton and that's where I practice lung right. medicine. You know, lung problems are common across mm -hmm. um, all areas um, and South Dakotans with lung disease um, deserve access to specialists and so pulmonology is where I landed and what I continue to do. Yeah, great. And we'll have plenty to talk about when it comes to lung disease, pretty common. We see a lot of it uh, in all of medicine and are glad to have you here tonight. Our timely topic is influenza. We're seeing a lot of influenza cases these last couple of weeks locally and um, I know that's something that you matters to you as a critical care doc, as a pulmonologist, right. that, that we want to prevent and, and catch these cases. So tell me what you've been seeing in Yankton. So, um, you know, the <laughs> flu season is part of every fall and winter in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter what part of the United States you're in, it's widespread at this time. Um, it's epidemic every year. We mm -hmm. just call it the flu season as part of that epidemic. And anyone can get it. Mm -hmm. um, and those of us who are healthy, it's it's a nuisance as much as anything, but can become very serious. And those patients who are very young, who are pregnant, who are older than 65, or who have chronic heart or lung disease, diabetes, these kinds of illnesses, it can be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. And there's not a really good treatment once you have it. Um, supportive care, there's some antivirals that can 
minimize the symptoms and maybe shorten the duration of illness, but the most important factor is getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And there's some misunderstanding about how important that is um, and how safe it is. It's mm -hmm. very safe yep. and it's very effective and it's very important. Mm -hmm. um, there's almost no excuse for not getting vaccinated if mm -hmm. you're six months of age or older. And um, there's some misunderstanding about whether it's an effective vaccination. Right. It's effective, maybe not 100% of the time, maybe less than 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's not only 10% of the time, like some of the news reports might have stated. Um, and even when it's not 100% effective, um, it does reduce in those patients who develop the flu despite the vaccination, yeah. the severity and duration of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So again, most important is to understand it's safe, it's mm -hmm. effective, and it's extremely important yeah yeah and even if you you know know someone who has a friend who got the flu shot but also got influenza that person could have ended up in the hospital but stayed out of the hospital because of their flu shot it's hard to prove or disprove that but we have pretty good evidence to support that well i think there is mm -hmm. i mean there's there's pediatric literature that shows mm -hmm. patients vaccinated against the flu are less likely to die as a complication of the flu um, mm -hmm. can you extend that to adults well, I mean, it's difficult to necessarily do that um, you know, and then there's the misunderstanding, well, I got the flu shot, I still got the flu, right. um, or I got sick. Well, it, it takes about two weeks for the flu shot mm -hmm. to be effective. That's another important reason to get it early in the season. We start to see cases as soon as October, mm -hmm. um, it usually peaks in November, December, January, February. Mm -hmm. It takes two weeks to really build up that immunity. Um, and it's important to get it each year. Right. Last year's flu shot might still be effective, mm -hmm. but not as effective as getting it a second or getting it each and every fall. Right, right. I had a patient actually come in to see me today asking, is there even a point in me getting the flu shot now? And my answer was yes. I mean, mm -hmm. the flu season is going to continue for for sure another month or two and could get worse than it is now. So yeah, it's never mm -hmm. too late. I mean, the flu season again generally ends in March, but mm -hmm. it's not too late at this point to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's, I get the question sometimes, maybe you have too, should I get a second flu shot? Yeah. You know, is, is, is it necessary to get a booster? There's not evidence that that's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, there is something called the high dose flu vaccine. Yeah. Do you use that? Our clinic does uh, as a policy. I have sort of mixed feelings of whether it has been proven to be right. effective enough to warrant its use. Yeah. But and so here's mm -hmm. what I tell patients. I say, if you're over 65, let's give you the high dose mm -hmm. flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the high dose flu vaccine, I'd rather you get yes. a form of the vaccine, mm -hmm. then wait or lose that opportunity to vaccinate you. Right, so right. I agree with you from that perspective. Getting yeah. a vaccine is more important than waiting for the high dose. And the high dose isn't indicated for those less than 65. Right, right. right. And it wasn't that long ago that we were only telling people of a certain age of young people and old people and people with lung disease to get the flu shot. And yeah. over the last five to 10 years, we're telling everybody to do it because um, supplies have been robust and we know that it can make young healthy people sick as well yeah and mm -hmm. i think the one other argument i want to just quickly address is sometimes mm -hmm. patients say well i'm young and healthy and even if yeah. i get the flu i'll be fine certainly that's almost definitely the case mm -hmm. however you're going to expose other individuals mm -hmm. um, whether it's you're knowledgeable or whether you're aware of that or not and so mm -hmm. it's a public health issue much yeah. more so than it is an individual person's issue right and i think it's a responsibility we all um, want to try and mm -hmm. respect and so be a good human being yeah. and get your flu shot. And I mean, missing a week of work is no walk in the park either if you do get a bad influenza. So, you know, one of the most common lung diseases that we see as far as chronic stuff includes COPD, which um, most people have heard of, probably a lot of our viewers either have or have a family member who has. How big a part of that is your practice as patients with COPD? Sure, so um, I think any physician in general care, um, whether it's family medicine, internal medicine, our physician assistant colleagues, nurse practitioners, see patients with COPD. Mm -hmm. As a pulmonologist, it's a bread and butter part of my practice. Mm -hmm. It's an everyday phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. multiple patients. Um, and it's a common illness. It's mm -hmm. the third leading cause now of death in the United mm -hmm. States, uh, moved up from fourth. Um, and it's ultimately treatable and preventable when recognized, especially early on. Mm -hmm. So if you have symptoms of cough, that's persistent, greater than eight weeks. Mm -hmm. If you're short of breath with activity, not explainable by other easy mm -hmm. solutions. If you have risk factors like occupational exposures yeah. or you smoke, mm -hmm. again, that's the biggest issue. If yep. you're a smoker with cough and shortness of breath or a family history of similar illness, you need to talk to your family doc, 
your PA, your nurse practitioner, um, your general internist mm -hmm. about having that evaluated further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, diagnosis, first step in diagnosis is pretty simple breathing tests that mm -hmm. most clinics uh, can do locally, so. It's very easy, mm -hmm. yes. Spirometry is not, you know, we, we call it a test, but there's no studying or preparation necessary. <laughs> the respiratory therapist will teach you or show you what you need to do. You'll perform the maneuvers. It's painless, mm -hmm. it's relatively inexpensive, and it will allow us to make a diagnosis yeah. and then offer appropriate treatment. Right, right. Great. Um, that you know, there are some folks who maybe are not smokers but develop COPD, and I think we're going to hear from a patient like that. Can you comment on some of these more odd cases and what what someone should maybe recognize if they're not a smoker? Sure. So first, I'll stress most importantly, smoking is yes. the is the main cause of COPD in modern nations like the United States, and and individuals who um, are struggling with smoking, uh, we want to help them mm -hmm. because their use of cigarettes is going to lead to complications like COPD or others. Mm -hmm. um, there are conditions, um, and one in particular called alpha-1 antitrypsin mm -hmm. deficiency. Mm -hmm. We're not talking asthma now. Um, we're focusing more on sort of COPD. Mm -hmm. Asthma can play a role here, but we'll try to separate the two. Where you inherit a deficiency in an enzyme, mm -hmm. a, a certain protein in our body, especially necessary to protect the lungs from injury, that can lead to development of COPD um, with or without smoking. Mm -hmm. Certainly smoking accelerates the process. Mm -hmm. So if you have a family history of you know, relatives, especially immediate family members with lung disease, especially those who never smoked, yeah. it, it's important to let your healthcare provider know about yeah. that. Yeah, good. Let's hear from a patient like that. So the primary cause of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is smoking, but there are other factors that may cause this, including genetics. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, is actually a hereditary lung condition in which you are um, born with a certain um, gene that helps ward off infections and stuff into your lungs. So without this, um, without this gene, when I get an infection, it actually attacks my lungs rather than um, protect them from illnesses when I was first diagnosed in 2001, I didn't really have too many symptoms. I knew that I had it. My father was um, tested and my mom was already positive. So at that time we knew that chances were pretty high that I was going to be a carrier, but also have, have the deficiency. My symptoms weren't real strong. Um, I had some shortness of breath upon exercise, going up hills, steps. Um, so back then it wasn't really a game changer in my life. Um, I knew I had it, so I tried to take care of myself. And with this disease, it just progressively gets worse. There is no treatment for this disease at all. It's just a matter of taking care of yourself and doing some preventative measures. In October of 2016, my oxygen levels were pretty low upon um, seeing my physician. So at that time I was put on oxygen. Um, wasn't quite 24 seven, but I did have um, a portable in case I did go out and get shortness of breath. But the oxygen was full time at night. By January of 2017, I was unable to go up steps anymore without really stopping using my rescue inhaler. And from there, it's just it seemed to take a steady decrease to the point where we're at now which is, it doesn't take much activity anymore to get that shortness of breath to come on. The best course of action I have, of course, is my rescue inhaler. Um, and with the oxygen, just taking some low deep breaths seems to help kind of get my oxygen level back up. And of course, just stopping and resting what I'm doing, um, just making sure that I sit down, relax, before I get up and attempt any kind of activity again. But definitely the inhalers do help and the oxygen. Their only long-term cure for the alpha-1 and now um, the very severe COPD that I have is a lung transplant. If you have any doubt, get tested. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is it's detected with a blood test. Um, it's very easy, very painless. It's a struggle when you have to breathe and can't get that deep breath. Um, so I would say just pre as much prevention as people can and, and get tested and know what's out there and, and take care of yourself while you can.
This is your show, and your questions are key to our show discussion. Call in your questions about breathing concerns to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. And we've got a few questions, so we'll just go ahead with those. A man from Brookings asks, are there known side effects to e-cigarettes? Um, yes, there are. So mm -hmm. um, electronic cigarettes or vaping is something that's become popular in the last year or two. Um, initially we thought as pulmonologists, maybe this will be a safe alternative for our patients addicted to traditional cigarettes mm -hmm. that are having damage from those, from smoking those. Unfortunately, they're not a solution. So number one, they don't really help patients quit smoking. Um, people who use e-cigarettes to try to quit smoking usually continue to smoke conventionally mm -hmm. and to use e-cigarettes. Next, they introduce another pop part of our population to e-cigarettes that maybe never would have tried yeah. nicotine in the first place. Yeah. Finally, um, they have their own side effects. Um, they can be dangerous as devices, uh, which maybe you've seen on YouTube or Facebook or elsewhere, but also they, they harm the lungs. Mm -hmm. um, there's already studies where uh, we do a procedures to put a scope down and wash the lungs out, and we see inflammatory mm -hmm. markers are oh, elevated, um, mm -hmm. consistent with airway injury, all the precursors to developing COPD that we can see from traditional cigarettes. Yeah. So what I explain to my patients um, and the Surgeon General and others in our field of expertise have said is that e-cigarettes are not a safe alternative to um, smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's something I want you to talk to your doctor about yeah. um, and you know see if there's another way that you can uh, break your addiction to nicotine. Yeah. Uh, but avoid e-cigarettes, they're not safe. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of public health institutions worried about e-cigarettes sort of providing this uh, intrigue for young people who might start smoking e-cigarettes even if they didn't smoke cigarettes, right. which is what you mentioned there too. There's, uh, there's not, unfortunately, there's not really a positive yeah. feature to e-cigarettes. Yeah, good, okay. Um, a totally unrelated topic, but a woman from Laverne would like to learn more about sarcoidosis, a sure. disease that you would see. Yeah, sarcoidosis is, is not a rare disease, but it's not common. Um, in my practice, I see it almost every day. Hmm. Um, we don't know what causes sarcoidosis. It's kind of mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, it's an inflammatory condition for sure. Um, is it post-infectious? Uh, we could argue that. Is it autoimmune? Mm -hmm. You could argue that. Um, but mostly we just don't know and there's no specific diagnosis for you. You can't, no doctor can do a test that says you right. have sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. We have to rule out other things like infection mm -hmm. and inflammation and cancer and then we say this is most consistent with sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. Sarcoid can affect any organ in the body um, but where it's most commonly found is in the lungs mm -hmm. and, and the important thing for all our listeners to, to recognize and be aware of is it's usually a self-limited problem or it's found incidentally. Mm -hmm. It's infrequent that it's a serious complicating illness that needs treatment and the reason I say that is because the treatment's very difficult yeah. and can be harmful itself. Yeah. So I trained at a place called the Mayo Clinic and um, I saw lots of difficult sarcoid patients and I had an attending there who said, you know Michael when you go out into your pulmonary practice um, you'll do the best job you can do with sarcoid patients mm -hmm. um, stopping harmful medicines or or explaining to them that they don't need a specific treatment mm -hmm. more than you'll be putting them on very toxic medicines that can sure. have severe side effects. So I think it's important to make sure you see someone who has some expertise in sarcoidosis yeah. and monitor um, for signs or symptoms of the disease, mm -hmm. but then recognize that it's rare yep. that it causes real harm to the body. Now in some instances it does, so I'm not saying it's not important, but mm -hmm. it's, it's really it's really necessary to understand exactly that it's a limited condition most mm -hmm. of the time and that treatment can be more harmful than good. Great, great. And yeah, you know, you, you say it's not a rare disease, but it's uncommon enough that it's not something that I see very often as a general internist. So definitely a reason to see someone who has specialty expertise. Um, is there a cumulative benefit to getting the flu shot every year? We touched on that a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, we think that there is. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, when you look at the way that vaccinations work, especially mm -hmm. the flu vaccine, it it causes your body to produce antibodies that protect you from getting the infection and also from the side effects or the symptoms of the infection. Sure. And those antibodies don't circulate for a, a limited amount of time. We don't necessarily know how long, but certainly they can be present 
beyond the 12 months between your typical flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we change the flu vaccine every year. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's got similar components, but it has three or four different types of flu that are most likely to affect us mm -hmm. um, during that flu season. Now, the previous year, there might be a different one or two that mm -hmm. will offer immunity in case that virus comes back around. Yeah, yeah. So ideally, everybody gets the flu shot every year would probably maximize both personal and community immunity to influenza. Yeah. All right, a woman from Hot Springs wants to know if secondhand smoke exposure might increase your chances for COPD. Yeah, no, without question. Yeah. Um, secondhand smoke is harmful and it certainly increases the risk for all the same conditions that primary smoke exposure causes mm -hmm. an increased risk for. Now, it's not nearly at the same level as that, sure. but it's still a real risk. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's unfair, I think, mm -hmm. to ask non-smokers to be exposed to a harmful side effect like secondhand smoke. Um, just in our society, that shouldn't be considered acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that's the reason behind a lot of laws that have been passed over the last 10 years to try and protect people from Absolutely. that. Absolutely. All right, um, a man from Park, South Dakota says, I'm a person that does not take the flu shot because I'm allergic to eggs. What are my options? Yeah. So um, this year, the current recommendation, yeah. and I'm just going to stick this in there quick. If people are looking for great information about the flu vaccine, go to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, yeah. and, and put in um, flu vaccinations or flu frequently asked questions. You'll get the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, but what we know about egg allergies is if you have a severe egg allergy, if you've you know been exposed to a vaccine or eggs and you get airway compromised, your throat swells, or you um, your blood pressure drops, you get dizzy, you pass out, then the traditional mm -hmm. flu vaccination's probably not safe for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you just have hives to it, um, the recommendation is go ahead and get the flu vaccine. Yep. Um, this year, the injectable form of the flu vaccine is the only one that's approved. Mm -hmm. um, they're not approving the flu mist right. um, just because of the concerns about its efficacy. Well, mm -hmm. I won't comment on the reasons, but, <laughs> um, and then there are some preparations that are not prepared with egg, um, mm -hmm. I think. I didn't you know, yeah. review that part, but, it's, there's, they're harder to come by. They're harder to come by, mm -hmm. but there could still be options for you. Yeah. So again, if your egg allergy isn't a severe one, um, it's safe to get the flu vaccine. But make sure you do it at your doctor's office. That's yep. the that's yep. the one recommendation is don't get it at the pharmacy or sure. at a flu clinic. Go to your doctor and say, I have this mild egg allergy. I want the flu vaccine. Yeah. We'll observe you for 30 minutes and make sure you do okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the vast majority of people who have historic egg allergies can safely get the flu shot. We Absolutely, think. Mm -hmm. it's the rare, rarer cases mm -hmm. that have a severe egg allergy that cannot get it. Yeah, good, good. Um, a man from Huron wants to know if there's a connection between obesity and lung disease. Um, so there is a connection. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily understand it 100%, but um, there are studies showing an increased risk for asthma in patients mm -hmm. who are obese. Certainly, um, there's a condition known as restrictive lung disease. We've touched on COPD, yeah. obstructive yep. pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. um, there's a condition called restrictive lung disease where the lung volumes are reduced. Your lungs are smaller. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to think of it, yeah. than they should be. Yeah. And when you're very obese, um, your chest wall is heavier and larger, and that can restrict yep. um, your ability to fill your lungs with air. Mm -hmm. um, your abdomen might be large, protuberant might push your diaphragm uh, mm -hmm. up into your chest and prevent you from being able to to lower your diaphragm, decrease your intra pleural pre or intrathoracic pressures and get air in. Yeah. So certainly obesity can be connected to mm -hmm. um, lung diseases. Another condition that can be associated is sleep <clears throat> apnea, yes. which can affect your breathing too. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, you know, getting that weight off or not gaining too much weight um, is important for mm -hmm. lung health. Yeah, yeah. How, can you talk a little bit about how sleep apnea, just the mechanism and why obesity is such a huge risk factor yeah. for that? So it, it's the primary risk factor. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that as you gain weight and your body gets larger, your airway gets smaller um, because of the tissue surrounding it. Your tongue gets larger, the tissues in your posterior oral pharynx, the area um, behind our tongue, um, they swell, and mm -hmm. as you fall off to sleep, that airway collapses, mm -hmm. um, and that obstructs 
your ability to get air into your lungs. It's not a problem with the way your lungs work. It's right. a problem with getting air to your lungs. Mm -hmm. And then that can lead to other complications like pulmonary hypertension and mm -hmm. high blood pressure and, and other complications that then make your health poorer. Right. And of course it affects the way you feel. Right. And so um, Most people are very tired. They yeah. might fall asleep at the wheel and that kind of thing. Right. And even if they're not tired, mm -hmm. their mood is altered. Mm -hmm. Their cognition, their you know, the sharpness of their thinking is yeah. altered and their mm -hmm. quality of life is reduced. Yep, yep, good. You, we mentioned briefly asthma. Now asthma and COPD kind of fall under the same umbrella of what we call obstructive lung disease, but what are the differences? Yeah, so I think there's, a, I'll try to touch just quickly on the biggest differences. So um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease means that you develop airflow obstruction that is permanent and chronic long term. Mm -hmm. Asthmatics have a more acute obstructive pulmonary disease when they're exacerbated, when they're sick because mm -hmm. of whatever trigger, they can't get the air out um, right. and they're short of breath and they're coughing and wheezing. It's driven by um, an eosinophilic process that's a type of cell in mm -hmm. our body and often associated with allergies. Okay, yep. Allergies don't cause asthma, asthma doesn't cause allergies, but the two are, are related to one another. Mm -hmm. And the treatment for asthma, okay, so it's patients, they get a trigger, whether it's a cold or exposure to perfume mm -hmm. or cigarettes or whatever. They cough, they wheeze, they're short of breath. We treat with steroids, yep. bronchodilators, um, they recover and their lung function returns to normal. Yep. COPD, more chronic, less about eosinophils and more about neutrophils and lymphocytes, different mm -hmm. types of white blood cells yep. and inflammation. Chronic exposures, smoking, yep. occupational things. Um, they can have triggers as well, mm -hmm. but when we, even when they're normal with their breathing, they have obstructive physiology, so they're yep. permanently obstructed. They need more long-term maintenance with what's called bronchodilator mm -hmm. medications, less about steroids. Mm -hmm. Steroids still can play a role, but yep. should be limited. Mm -hmm. Asthma steroids are the cornerstone or mm -hmm. the most important treatment. Yeah, yeah. And asthma often diagnosed in childhood, but not always. We you know, sometimes diagnose it I, in adults. I think it's important mm -hmm. to recognize that part of things too. COPD develops later in life. Yep. Um, Asthma is typically associated with a pattern of symptoms that's present in childhood. Mm -hmm. Occasionally it's adult on, in onset. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do have some very severe asthmatics who are COPD patients. Right. Their, their asthma just resulted in inflammation that caused their airway to remodel and become sure. chronically obstructed. Yeah. And we, we talk about in adults, sometimes there's a crossover syn syndrome. It's not really mm -hmm. clear what the primary culprit is, and they kind of can act the same way at yeah. a certain, when it's severe in I, any case. Yeah, so. I, I saw two today who I mm -hmm. would call those overlap yeah. syndrome, where they have COPD and asthma. Mm -hmm. And um, you know then the treatment's a little different than one or the other. Yeah, great, okay. Um, a woman from Brookings feels she needs to take a deep breath every now and then to regain her breath, but it's not associated with physical exertion. Yeah. What should she do? Um, so that's actually pretty normal. Yeah. Um, sighing Good. respirations are an important part of what we do every day. Mm -hmm. Not just because your spouse has frustrated you or your kids have done something that makes you unhappy. It's, <laughs> it's normal mm -hmm. to take a big deep breath and sigh. And part of that's to correct something called microatelectasis where the smaller portions of our airway, when we don't take those big deep mm -hmm. breaths, um, kind of collapse on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that sighing respiration corrects that. Mm -hmm. So I actually tell patients sighing is a normal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Maybe practice some deep breathing and sighing every hour or two mm -hmm. to prevent those complications. Yeah. Now, could it be indicative of something more serious? I, I suppose that's possible, but if that's the only symptom or the only thing she notices, it's probably If normal. she's not short of breath when she does exert herself, for right. example, probably it's not a real lung, no. lung disease. It's great. Probably normal. Yeah, great. Okay. To correctly diagnose and choose treatment, it may be helpful to see the lungs. There's an alphabet soup of tests and equipment to help your physician look inside your chest. Pneumonia, asthma, emphysema, pulmonary embolus uh, will all show up on chest images. A PET scan is a tool especially used in cancer patients, oncology. This is a 3D image of a, of a body, and this is from the PET exam. And this big black area is a tumor. This is a lung cancer. Uh, this is in the left side of the patient. Uh, we're looking at a mirage of the patient, so left and right are kind of switched. Uh, here's uh, a cross-sectional image through that, and this is that big lung mass that we're seeing on, on this first monitor. Uh, this monitor shows a chest x-ray 
this person probably started with a chest x-ray and maybe has some shortness of breath or cough. We still do chest x-rays. There's two ways to do that. A portable exam is one view and a two view chest is from the front and from the side. This is a, a two view chest x-ray, what we call a PA and a lateral on a young lady and it's normal. If there were pneumonia, you'd see it as a white area or something or a spot or a tumor, uh, it would show up. This center image is from a what we call a high resolution chest CT. It's just done in a specific fashion. It's still a chest CT, but we do thinner images and some special techniques. And this is coronal. So you'll see the diaphragms are flattened. They normally should be rounded. That means the lung volumes are increased. And you can just see all these black areas. Um, this is really extensive emphysema. This chest x-ray uh, shows emphysema, flat diaphragms. And on the far right, I'm just confirming this is another, this is in the axial plane again, just showing a lot of emphysema. This um, shows a uh, cavity. It's probably better seen on, on a coronal plane, but this was a lung cavity. Could be related to a, an advanced pneumonia. And here's that cavity, round thing with an air space in it. It's a mass that now has cavitated, either because of necrotic pneumonia or a necrotic tumor. If somebody comes in through the emergency department with shortness of breath and they're concerned about a blood clot in the lung, then we'll do a specific test to look for the pulmonary embolus of the blood clot. This image is a cross-sex image, chest CT, specifically done to look for blood clots on the lung, uh, emboli. And these black things are clot or emboli within the pulmonary arteries, very extensive. You can see it. If this is uh, the ax what we call axial images through a chest CT special timing to evaluate the pulmonary arteries. This black area is um, embolus, uh, blood clot in the lung. There's another one over here. There's quite a few in each side. One of the concerns in South Dakota is with our rural medicine, you don't have the tools at every site, but probably they have access to a chest machine, so they get a chest x-ray. If there's some unusual densities or something, then they can investigate further with the CT and there's a lot of hospitals that will have a CT unit, so it's, it's very accessible uh, for that, and it's pretty cost effective. I wouldn't use it on everybody, but it can help determine you know, what the doctors are looking for. We're back. So lots of imaging can be done when focus on the lungs and we take care to try and choose that wisely in a way that doesn't expose our patients both to unnecessary radiation but also to finding of things that are meaningless that leads to a lot of extra testing and medical care. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that's important for all patients and their physicians to recognize mm -hmm. is you know, testing is important but it needs to be um, chosen based upon symptoms and signs of disease and it's there's no cookbook to medicine when it comes to doing tests mm -hmm. because you have to deal with the results and many times those results are falsely positive or falsely negative right. so everything's limited to its ability based upon the pretest probability of an illness um, mm -hmm. so it's great to have all the technology available out there but you have to make sure you understand um, why your physician's using it and don't be afraid to ask right. why are you doing this test yeah great all right, let's get back to our questions because we've got a lot of them. Um, a woman from Pipestone got a flu shot in her arm three months ago and it still hurts. Hmm. That's not something that I've seen. Do you have any thoughts no. on so that? So it's normal for there to be some discomfort mm -hmm. after a flu shot. You should experience that. So the shot should be given and then you're gonna notice some soreness in that area for a day, uh, maybe two days afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's just the local reaction to the flu shot. Yep. Um, I suppose maybe a nerve could have been Sure. affected by the shot. Yeah. I, I would think though that it's something else. Yeah. I think yeah. it's probably, probably not the flu shot. Maybe there's a rotator cuff problem or I can't yeah. guess, but yeah. it's probably not related yeah. to the flu shot. Uh, similar question, a woman from Brookings is wondering if it's common to have rash, redness, and pain from the high dose flu vaccine. Do we see more side effects with the high dose vaccine compared to the normal dose vaccine? Not that I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah. I don't I think don't there know. is. You can have a local reaction yeah. like she describes and it's mm -hmm. harmless. Maybe put a little ice on the area. Yeah. Um, but but it shouldn't be any more likely with the high dose than the regular dose. Good. All right. Let's stick with the flu shot. A man from Sioux Falls asked, do they recommend either the high dose flu vaccine or the quadrivalent? 
and why for someone he this is a 70 year old guy so sure. why wh how do we make there's all these flu vaccines where do our recommendations come from yeah so the experts um, with the mm. federal government to design the flu shot each year based upon the most likely mm -hmm. flu virus to affect us in the United States um, turn that information over to the manufacturers mm -hmm. who then um, typically make at least a trivalent, but in some instances a quadrivalent. Maybe they're trying to sell their product, right? <laughs> okay, it gives you protection against another form of the virus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it more advantage potentially if that type of virus is here, if there's that fourth sure. one? Um, the high dose, again, you talked about that a little mm -hmm. earlier. It's controversial mm -hmm. about just how important that is. As we get older or we have chronic illness, our body's immune system maybe isn't as mm -hmm. effective as it could be if we were younger or healthier. Sure. And the idea is to stimulate it with a little more of the virus mm -hmm. to cause that immune reaction to be more effective. Yep. But I think it'd be hard for me to necessarily quote specific studies that said the high dose flu vaccine right. does that. Yeah, I think you know I think there are studies that say that uh, people over 65 produce more antibodies. Whether that translates into what we call clinical benefit is right. to be determined. But probably, I mean, not potential harm that we know right. of. Right. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's either, always so. the question with mm -hmm. vaccination: is are we preventing death with right. vaccinations or not? And. You know, the long and short is it doesn't matter. We're preventing significant morbidity, mm -hmm. um, you know, injury and illness to our community when we vaccinate. There's no argument about right. that. Right, right, good. Changing gears here, a woman from Hermosa has noted chemicals on the road in Rapid City that look like a fog. Is it magnesium chloride and does it have any effect on a person's lungs? So that's not a question I can answer <laughs> easily. She might have to contact the Department of Transportation or the Roads Department about that. Certainly I think fumes that are present uh -huh. in the air can be harmful to us. Um, you know, you don't want to expose yourself to anything that might harm your lungs. A lot of that stuff is just condensation or steam or sure. vapors as opposed mm -hmm. to truly chemical fumes. And I suspect that what she's seeing, again, I might be going out on a limb, but is the process of that chemical melting sure. the ice or the, the water mm -hmm. causing some condensation or evaporation. Yeah. I can't say yeah. for sure. Yeah. Certainly, and there—I mean, there is some real chemical exposures. Right. There's pollution in in large urban areas that that can contribute to lung disease too. What do we? Anything that we see in South Dakota that you? Um, so you know, occupational exposures are sure. a real phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, patients, uh, you know, in plants where chemicals are utilized to mm -hmm. break down, uh, whether it's metals or you know, cleaning products, or even in your own home mm -hmm. to make the mistake of mixing a bleach with a base, you know, a a vinegar sure. type basic substance with a chlorine bleach, you can get exposed to you know very toxic chemicals. Um, farmers can develop mm -hmm. conditions like farmer's lung, yep. which isn't actually due to dust exposure alone, but an allergic reaction to some of the thermophilic, some of the types of bacteria in the soil. Mm -hmm. So it's important, even if you're not a smoker, if you're exposed in your occupation to certain noxious or inhaled substances to talk to your doctor about your symptoms. Yep, yep, yep. And that's, you know, why we sometimes ask some of those questions that you might say, why would my doc ask me that? We're digging for some of those exposures too. All right, a woman from Worthington has had a sinus infection for two to three weeks as well as general con congestion. Is this the flu? No. no. Okay. Yeah. So um, <laughs> what's important to recognize is the flu has a very specific set of symptoms mm -hmm. and they're limited. Um, so when you get exposed to influenza, you're first going to have a sore throat, tickly, itchy sore throat. That's going to make you want to cough. Your nose is going to drip and drain and, and maybe be congested as your body responds to that infection. It's going to, your body's going to release um, um, things to fight the infection that then cause you maybe to have body aches and a fever. Mm -hmm. So those are the big symptoms. You're going to have a sore throat. You're going to have a tickle that might make you cough. Your nose is going to drip and drain, maybe be congested, and you're going to have body aches and fever. Mm -hmm. Feel pretty miserable. And yeah. that's going to last three to five days. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's the typical flu. Maybe a week, maybe 10 days. But if it's beyond that, you've developed a secondary complication mm -hmm. to the flu. You've got something else going on. Mm -hmm. um, and sinus symptoms are common. We all sure. get sinus symptoms. And mm -hmm. most of the time, they're self-limited. Yep. You don't need treatment for sinus symptoms that are a week long yeah. or even two weeks long. Yeah. Even maybe at three weeks. You know, After right. that, then it's maybe time to talk to your doctor about, about possibly having a sinus infection. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But no, that's not the flu. Not the flu. 
A man from Sioux Falls uses a non-vented space heater to keep his home warm. Is there a danger for gas leak in the home due to the lack of venting? Yeah, so it depends upon the fuel source. Uh -huh. Is it carbon-based, like a gas or propane, mm -hmm. um, or coal or wood? Um, it's a space heater, it's probably electric. Mm -hmm. So really electric heat doesn't it doesn't produce carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, I should say, right. which is the toxic thing we worry about without venting. Mm -hmm. So if it's an electric space heater, the biggest risk is the thing falling over or something mm -hmm. brushing against it and catching fire, mm -hmm. which then is going to give you a, a bunch of problems. But if it's burning a, a carbon-based fuel like propane, yep. natural gas, um, kerosene, um, coal or or wood then absolutely yeah big risk if it's not vented properly yeah yeah i recently saw a patient who lives near in our community and uses a wood burning stove in a poorly ventilated house and we did have to worry about carbon monoxide poisoning yep. that's so a it, real risk yeah all right i'm a caretaker for my father who is able-bodied he never smoked and is 87 but now has shortness of breath he worked in an environment that had asbestos what could be done to help his breathing. He refuses to see doctors. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to know what might be causing mm -hmm. a shortness of breath. Asbestos exposure was common amongst laborers, those in the military, yep. um, and it causes most often a disease of the pleura, mm -hmm. which is for the most part pretty innocent and benign. It, the lining of the, the outside lining, of the sorry, lungs. The yep. lining of the lungs. Mm -hmm. And it's more of an, a phenomenon that's found on x-ray than yep. it is necessarily a clinical condition, but it can also cause an interstitial disease, mm -hmm. scarring in the lungs called asbestosis. Yep. Totally different than the plural, the lining of the lung disease. Mm -hmm. Only way to know is for him to see a doctor, have an exam, do a chest x-ray, maybe do a breathing test. At, at 80 um, plus Seven. years of age, mm -hmm. 87, there's a variety of other possible sure. causes for a shortness of breath. And that's important for all our patients. Just because you're short of breath doesn't mean you have lung disease. Right. It could be your heart. It could be... Um, you know, anemias, blood yeah. count disorders, mm -hmm. it could be liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, acid problems in your bloodstream. So the lungs are, are often an innocent bystander to other disease processes that make you feel short of breath. Yeah. So um, it, it's necessary to, to take a history or to see a doctor and talk yeah. about all the possible causes. Yeah, yeah. A history in the physical exam goes a long way to helping mm -hmm. us understand what might be causing that. Yeah. So right. if you should, Maybe see a doctor if yeah, he's that's, symptomatic enough. Yeah. <laughs> a woman from Huron would like us to discuss the idea of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, sure. So mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about this before. Yeah. It's not a common condition. Um, it happens um, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. We'll separate it quickly between what's called primary pulmonary hypertension, a much different disease mm -hmm. than secondary pulmonary hypertension. Primary pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension is young women, typically, mm -hmm. okay, women in their late 20s, early 30s, mm -hmm. who are perfectly healthy otherwise, but have this shortness of breath that's insidious and worsens over time mm -hmm. for no good reason. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have, they're not smokers, they don't have other conditions that cause them to have lung disease. And that's an inherited problem, basically, and it's something to do with the smooth muscle and the arteries of the lung that causes the pressures to be higher and makes the heart work harder to pump blood to the lungs. Mm -hmm. Those patients need specialty care. They need to go to some place that has pulmonary hypertension experts. Mm -hmm. Secondary pulmonary hypertension is much more common, yep. and it's a consequence almost every time of another disease process. Mm -hmm. Whether it's heart disease or lung disease, it's typically one of those things. Mm -hmm. Smokers with bad emphysema will develop pulmonary hypertension mm -hmm. induced by low oxygen sure. levels. The treatment is managing their COPD and yep. their emphysema. Patients who get blood clots in their lungs mm -hmm. will develop pulmonary hypertension, need to treat the blood clots in their lungs. Yep. Patients who have connective tissue diseases, rare conditions like mm -hmm. lupus and other other connective tissue diseases can get a pulmonary hypertension syndrome. Mm -hmm. Manage that disease process. And then those who have left ventricular disease can get right heart disease yep. or heart induced pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. Most of them, it's about treating the disease that yep. led to the pulmonary hypertension, sometimes also being on medicines to treat that high pressure in the lungs. It's different than the mm -hmm. blood pressure we measure on your right. arm. Right. It, it can only be estimated either by by an ultrasound yep. of your heart or another test called a right heart catheterization. Yep, yep, good. And the first portion that you talked about, that primary mm -hmm. pulmonary hypertension, rare, sometimes goes undiagnosed for a period of time because we don't see it very often. Exams kind of look normal for a long time until things get severe. They do, and those yeah. patients often end up on a transplant list. Yeah. Yep. Um, there are some it's medicines. A bad it's a bad disease. Mm -hmm. It's it's a bad disease. Mm -hmm. But it's much different than the majority of the pulmonary hypertension right. you and I see mm -hmm. in the community every day. Good. 
A woman from Trip asks, what are the causes for DVT? And yeah. that what can be associated with blood clots in the lungs. Yeah, so um, DVT or deep venous thrombosis mm -hmm. um, results from um, certain factors where the blood isn't flowing as effectively as it should in our mm -hmm. veins, or it's more likely to clot, to, mm -hmm. to form a clot when it shouldn't. You know, blood right. needs to clot. When yeah. it escapes from the vein mm -hmm. or, or outside of our body, it needs to clot to prevent more bleeding from occurring. But while it's in the vein or artery, it should flow freely. Mm -hmm. If we're inactive for a long period of time, which we all are at night when we sleep, but for right. some reason after surgeries where there's other inflammatory changes and inactivity, that blood mm -hmm. can be become more likely to form a clot. Mm -hmm. So surgeries, um, medical illnesses. It's yeah. why when you go in the hospital, they might give you a shot yep. to prevent blood clots or mm -hmm. put those squeezers on your legs. Um, inherited factors can play a role. Yep. Maybe that's what she's touching on. If your mom had blood clots and your sister had blood clots or your brother, mm -hmm. um, you may have a genetic factor that increases the chance that you might have a blood clot. Mm -hmm. Important to sort of discuss that with your doctors. And then certain illnesses like cancer sure. um, can cause your blood to be more likely to clot. Mm -hmm. um, Smokers can have an increased risk for blood clots mm -hmm. as well, especially young women on birth control, yep. that smoke. Mm -hmm. um, estrogen, you know, there's some association between oral contraception and blood clots too. Yeah. So it's mostly about um, stasis, about not moving, yep. like after surgery or illness. Yep. Um, and those other conditions yeah. we talked yeah. about. Yeah, so possibly a lot of factors and, pro and probably some that we don't understand. No, for being most honest. blood clots, we don't yeah. know why they happened. Right. Yeah, they just did. Yeah, good. We just got a couple minutes left, so we'll try to get through our questions. A woman has never had problems with her lungs and smoked until her late 20s. At age 73, she found out she has scarring on her lungs. Mm -hmm. She worked in a post office for roughly 26 years and is wondering if paper dust could yeah. be the cause of scarring. So it sounds like she's describing pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, a condition of scarring in the lungs, typically unrelated to smoking. Um, most of the time, we don't know why it happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's idiopathic, and mm -hmm. you may have heard people say idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly there is interstitial lung disease or scarring in the lungs associated with occupational exposures. Sure or related to other illnesses, like mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and those, mm -hmm. again, connective tissue diseases can cause that. So I'd, I'd look into that for her. Mm -hmm. um, and then occupational exposure, sometimes paper millers um, or those exposed to chemicals from print mm -hmm. and dust can develop an injury in their lungs mm -hmm. um, that can look like pulmonary fibrosis, um, like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, sure. a chronic allergic lung disease. Mm -hmm. The thing to do is like, um, they talked about on those imaging studies is to see your doctor, yep. have an exam, um, listening to your lungs, I can often tell if you have this, yep. do a breathing test and then maybe get that CT scan yeah. like he talked about. Yeah, good. Uh, a woman from Aberdeen would like to know if consecutive flu shots can cause Alzheimer's disease. Not aware of any mm -hmm. um, connection between flu shots and Alzheimer's disease, flu shots and autism, you yeah. know, none of these things can be proven um, yeah. to have a correlation with one another. Right, right. And you know, again, Alzheimer's being common, it would be really hard to yeah. to attribute that to uh, flu shots. I can't think of any physiologic reason that that would ever right. be related to right. one another. Right. Have you been have you seen any flu in the hospital or in your ICU this year yet? Um, I don't think we've had a case in the ICU. Mm -hmm. We've had flu in the hospital. We had a, at least one death in Yankton County. Um, and I think now we're up over a thousand flu cases for South Dakota yeah. this flu season. Yep. We've got and numbers at the end of the show. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. we'll talk about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Dot quiz question. People with obstructive lung disease like asthma, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis have trouble getting air in or getting air out. The correct answer is out. If you can't get old air out of your lungs, you can't bring fresh air back in. It was Rosemary Drager who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Rosemary, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Because they want you to be there for the many milestones yet to come. Because you don't want to miss out on the little things. There are many reasons to get life-saving cancer screenings. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. But regular self-exams and mammograms can catch it early when it's most treatable. Promise. 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 Make the promise to get screened. Do it for the people you love. For more information about life-saving screenings or available financial assistance, visit GetScreenedSD.org. I keep a pack of cigarettes in my office. It was a gift. 
from a patient who decided after nearly 20 years of my encouraging, cajoling, and quite frankly nagging, that it was finally time to give them up. That's the thing about changing habits. Sometimes it takes a long time. We have different ways of understanding how people approach change. One of the most universally used is something we call the stages of change. People move from not being willing to even consider the downsides of their current habits to seeing those downsides and weighing the advantages of a change to making plans to develop new behaviors and then to actively practicing those new habits. From my perspective, practice is the often underemphasized concept there. Developing new habits and breaking old ones takes lots and lots of practice. Whatever your goal is, becoming a non-smoker, losing weight, completing your first marathon, or even organizing your garage, it helps to have a concrete plan of action. Expect setbacks. I like to tell my patients that babies don't learn to walk overnight. First they roll, then they sit, then they crawl, and then they cruise along the furniture, and finally, they take those first unsteady steps. It takes them about a year to get to that point. Along the way, they fall a lot. But they keep getting back up to try it again. And in what seems like the blink of an eye, they start running away from you at bedtime. There are some take home lessons in that story. First, change is a process. A daunting challenge is more approachable if you break it down into smaller incremental steps. Getting healthy is hard. Getting to bed half an hour earlier is easier. Second, consider yourself a learner. I love to encourage smokers not to think of it as quitting smoking, but as learning to be a non-smoker. If you're quitting and you have a cigarette with your coffee, it's tempting to decide you failed and throw in the towel. If you view it instead as learning not to smoke, it's easier to finish that cigarette and try again. Learners aren't failures when they haven't mastered their topic. If you smoke that cigarette, ask yourself, why? And then ask yourself, what can I do instead next time? Keep asking yourself those questions. Keep getting back up. Keep trying again. Tenacity pays off. I have a pack of cigarettes to prove it. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. Michael Pietala, for volunteering to travel up here to our studio to help with tonight's program. The flu spread early this year and it has already taken a toll in the U.S., including South Dakota. 256 cases were added this week, bringing us to 1,038 statewide. Sadly, there have been eight deaths so far this season in South Dakota. The CDC recommends everyone over six months get a flu shot. Getting your shot now will give you the best protection during the coming months. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. is your show as you may ask anything medical and we'll do our best to answer your questions next time on call with the prairie doc major funding for on call with the prairie doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care 
the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Black Hills Medical Society. Third District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison and Flandreau. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee. And Swiftel Communications.